Yeah, and at the time, it was, I felt the gravity of that message that, wow, okay, this is what they're asking me to do. And I had no idea what that was going to look like, no idea. And it has been until now that I really feel like as I'm talking about the book and I'm talking about the plight of animals and the way they're reaching out to us and asking for us to connect with them on a soul level is now when I finally realize, ah, this is what that means. Wonderful. Taking that a step further, you had mentioned Rasha. Um, also, you had uh, a wonderful hawk named Thalia. And um, you, you say that they brought you a lot of lessons. That was one of them. How about some more lessons from them? Yeah, Talia was a great helper with looking at and, and working through my own fears. Uh, she was a very high-strung bird, I guess I would say. Um, very right brain extrovert, so very much in her emotions and and fear could really take her over quickly. And she had a hard time living in captivity. And that very much mirrored what I was going on inside. I had a lot of anxiety, and that had been shown to me when I was out on the island, but I hadn't had the opportunity to work through it. And it was once I started spending time with Talia and realizing that I... I was just mirroring her anxiety that I wasn't able to help her as much as I wanted because even though I was faking calm, I looked calm, I was standing calm and speaking calm on the outside, I was still feeling anxiety on the inside. And so that, because of my uh, intense desire to be able to be there for her, I really had the opportunity to start working on the inside about how do I, how do I, deal with this anxiety? How do I heal old fears or hurts so that I can be there more for her? And and that kind of unfolded in a number of different layers, but we definitely went into the shadow realms in our time together, and she was a great helper with that and with, our, with working through, um, yeah, being having a wild nature and living in the quote-unquote civilized world, right? And, Absolutely. Yeah, and Grasha was she was just a great helper and and learning about lightness and friendship and um, being willing to share with other people. It was during the time that I was working with her that I started uh, finding other like-minded people that uh, were seeing and uh, having similar experiences to me. So I talked about earlier about. Um, new friendships forming when I moved into shamanism, and that was around the time that I was with Grasha. And I also, it was really important to me that she, I was, since I was training her, that she be comfortable with other people in her life. So I really did have to spend a lot of time with other people, too, and, and forge new friendships. And, and this, seems, this seems to be an extension uh, of your chapter on healing wounds in your book, Gracious Wild, in which you say that encounters with humans hadn't really fulfilled you, but that you learned fulfillment with the relationship from animals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people have that experience where they feel really more comfortable with animals than they do with people. Because yeah. uh, animals are typically less manipulative and more straightforward in who they are and what they want and and what they and what they have to offer. Uh, people have set up these elaborate. Um, manipulations, elaborate illusions, belief systems around themselves to um, protect themselves or get what they're looking for. And that can be hard uh, to understand. And so it actually, um, I always felt more comfortable with animals in my whole life. And I've really, um, since my time working with Grasha, actually have made an intentional effort to um, be more be able to respond and relate more in the human world and but it was absolutely something that i had to uh practice that and and study about and learn how to do that's very true with animals what you see is what you get they're 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 exactly what they are and that's it yeah stacy we have a question from chuck in the chat room and he wants to know if there's a significance if any of the number of a type of animal you see at a time like three hawks or two owls is there some meaning to that? Oh, definitely. And you can look to numerology to learn more about that. 
the numero- numerology talks about the significance of different numbers. Um, I even pull on feng shui. So in feng shui, they associate different numbers to different areas of the house. But if you look at the number three, you can uh, relate that back to the Holy Trinity or the number seven. And there's seven directions on the medicine wheel. So you can start to delve into um, numerology and looking at, and then pair that up with what species of animal you saw. So if you saw three red-tailed hawks, it would be something to do with um, community or the tribe, and and then the association of the number three as being, well, we don't have the two, we have the two polar opposites and then the balance, right, with the number three. So um, you think about a triangle, that's a good way of to come into what that might mean. You know, thinking about feng shui, which gua or corner would you associate the hawks with? <laughs> That's fun. Hadn't thought much about that. It would be, I would say, um, Grasha was. She would probably either be helpful people in travel or family. Wonderful. And Talia would have probably been um, skills and knowledge okay. or fame and reputation. There you go. And for those who don't know feng shui, uh, what you're dealing with, they have a thing called the bagua, which means eight gua. And the guas can be laid over, for example, your home, and each area of your home has a significance. And so one part of the home has to do with helpful people, as you just mentioned. Uh, one a part of the home has to do with career. One has to do with relationships. One has to do with family, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of these days, we've got to get uh, Lori Sue. My wife, Lori Sue, is a feng shui master. Mm-hmm. We've, got to get her on, we've got to get her on the show to talk about feng shui. I don't think we've ever done a feng shui show, right, Chris? No, I don't think we've ever done it. Chris, you're yeah. muted. You're muted, Chris. I, I, we did a show years ago before you were hosting with me, uh, but, I mean, we're talking about four four or five years ago. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's time for another fun show. show. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Um, you want to do the question in the chat room? Uh, no, well, why don't you take 15, then I'll do the question in the chat okay. room. Okay. You, know, you, you shared the story of a sexual assault that happened to you when you were in high school. How did you get the courage to share that story in writing? Yeah, it's uh, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so here we are in the midst of a lot of people talking about this topic. And this is a one of the pieces of the book that I reworked over and over and over again. Um, some pieces of the book I wrote it, and as you read it, those are how I initially wrote them, but this one was a tough one for me because I felt it was important to share, to really get the depth of what the Hawks had to offer me. I really wanted to share the depth of what I was in process with in their company. And this was a really big one. Uh, Talia was there for me during that process. I It happened um, in a situation where the, uh, the guy that um, – that it happened with, he went and told the story before I had a chance to tell the story. And so the way he spun the story was not my experience. And But because the whole collective belief system of the school went with the story that he told, that uh, is the one that I just had to let be. I didn't get a chance to share my story. And so it really was about 10 years later when I was, was working with um, the sh- per shamanic practitioner that was helping me through a lot of various wounds that were kind of coming up for me at that time in my life. Um, I shared the story with her because it was starting to haunt me again, and she's the one that helped me come into realization about what my experience was and that it was a sexual assault and um, come to terms with it, really. She did soul retrieval work around it, which helped immensely, and then I just had the opportunity to just go and be with Talia uh, afterwards and the days uh, following was my revelation about what had really happened and uncovering that. And she was just, animals can be so much comfort when we're going through, um, either going through a trauma again, reliving it and processing it, or when we're going through it for the first time, they can be such great company because they don't expect us to talk about it. They don't expect us to explain it. They're just there in the present moment, a reminder of that everything's okay and we're here in the moment and and life does go on. So she was incredible support to me during that time. 
And yeah. thank and thank you for the courage of sharing that story so that there are so many out there who've had the similar experience. And by your sharing that story, I'm sure it promotes healing to all of them. Yeah, yeah. that's my that's definitely my hope and that other people uh, yeah, have the same courage to is to share their stories because I think that's really a lot of the problem is that it's not talked about and it falls into the shadow and um, perpetrators can get away with what they do because it's, it's not talked about. Absolutely. Um, one of our friends in the chat room, Bana, wants to know, if you see a hawk on the ground, not moving, but looking at you or watching you, what does it mean? Well, see, my first inclination as the rescuer would be to run in and make sure, oh, is everything okay? Can it actually fly? (laughs) And then I'd maybe think about what that means. Um, Any bird that's on the ground and that's not taking off in your presence is speaks of grounding, of being grounded. Uh, That can have either a positive or a negative connotation. It could be a need to get grounded, um, to stop with the lofty ideals or the lofty thoughts and just spend some time on the ground in touch with the mother. Or it could be that you are grounded in something you're looking to do, trying to get off the ground, get some project going, get something moving in your life and you're not able to. And I would say the hawk would be uh, a reflection of that. And hawks and eagles are both uh, reputed to have amazing eyesight. They say eagle eye and hawk eye. Um, is that true? Or are they? Uh, is their vision that sharp? Yes, it is. So what we see and focus um, at four or five feet away, they see focused 20 feet away. So they have four or five times better ability to focus than we do. They have an incredibly, so we know about rods and cones. Those are the light receptors at the back of the eye. They have, um, you know, quite a bit. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but they have um, many times more of those uh, photoreceptor cells at the back of their eyes than we do. And just to follow up, one of our other guests in the chat room, uh, not identified, just with a number, wants to know if that same thing applies to city pigeons. And I'll answer that. <laughs> I, I'll answer that. If the city pigeon is sitting there looking at you, they're looking to get something fed. They want you to throw that's them something right. to eat. So that's why they're standing there. <clears throat> yeah. And you know, you know what birders call pigeons? What's that? They call them rock doves. That's the actual species name for them. Rock doves. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's how it was the joke when my husband and I first started learning birding is, you know, we'd have to catalog all the birds we'd see and we'd write down rock doves and it was always a joke like, that's well, a pigeon, right? But yeah, they're known as rock doves. So that, but we see them in a different light that way when we think of them as a dove, which they are. They're related yeah. to all other doves and they actually originate, they're called rock doves because they like to live on cliffs and that's why they adapt well to our cities because we have these buildings that emulate cliffs. Uh, so it's not, um, they've just done an incredibly good job. There's a number of animals like that that have done an incredibly good job of adapting to the environments that we create. Wonderful. Stacy, what are people sharing that they gain from reading Gracious Wild? One of the biggest things for sure, is their their ability to uh, have their own encounters with wildlife and their own intuitions affirmed. Even though they're reading my story uh, and they haven't gone and lived on an island or had the opportunity to work with a hawk in person, they still have had these profound encounters with wildlife. And reading the book wakes that up in them and helps them have more confidence to start sharing these stories and and believing in the significance of them and also believing in themselves. You know, so much of the story is about my own questioning of, well, who am I and was my authentic self and, and how can I have the courage to be more of who I am in the world? And a lot of people have expressed to me that they, that it's really helped them be more brave about who they are. The wonderful Stacy Couch. Her book is entitled "Gracious Wild: A Shamanic Journey with Hawks." Stacy, please tell our listeners again where they can get your book and your website. They can get the book at a local bookseller if they go ahead and if it's not there on the shelves, you can definitely have them order it for you, or you can go to Amazon.com. And my website is wildgratitude 
com. I've got a blog on there with a whole bunch, almost a couple dozen at this point, reading.